All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, all right. So welcome, everyone. Uh, this webinar is Creating an Equitable Syllabus. My name is Sochil Tirado. I am a faculty mentor with CDC, and I'm pleased to introduce you to our wonderful facilitators. We have two facilitators today. Uh, we have Brielle plump Erike and um, Jack Jacqueline Penos. Um, to give you a little background on our presenters, uh, Brielle has been an adjunct faculty member in communication studies at multiple community colleges and state universities in California since 2016. Recently, her passion for creating innovative and equitable classroom experiences led her to pursue professional development in distance education. And she currently has an additional appointment as an instructional designer at UC Santa Cruz. Her favorite topics to teach are intellectual communication and health communication because they allow her to weave principles of diversity and inclusion, not only in her pedagogy, but also, also into the curriculum. She believes all classrooms are spaces for collaboration, growth, and community building. Jacqueline Penos is a professor of psychology and mindfulness for Southwestern College, as well as an equity transfer, as, as well as an equity trainer for SDSU. She is passionate about sharing techniques for mental health, mindfulness, meditation, and all things diversity, equity, and inclusion. She is also a well be a well-being educator who shares mindfulness techniques for the classroom and beyond. Uh, during the webinar, we will also be linking you to a survey for you to provide your feedback. We'll be dropping uh, the survey in the chat every 30 minutes in the beginning of the session and then every 15 minutes. Uh, we also thank you, uh, I'm sorry, we, all, we ask that you fill out this survey to let us know how we did. And so we can create programming that is more tailored to the needs of our systems moving forward. Uh, lastly, while At One offers badges as proof of completion for our courses, we do not provide a badge for attending this webinar. However, if your institution requires proof of attendance for flex credit or professional development advancement, please remain until the end of the webinar, complete a survey and request a copy of your response to be sent to you through, through the Google form. You can use that as confirmation, uh, as proof of your attendance. All right, so without further mm -hmm. delay, I will go ahead and turn it over to our wonderful presenters. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are very happy to be here. We want to start the presentation, uh, excuse me, before we start the presentation, it's very important for us to do a land acknowledgement. So I come from, um, and with a lot of respect for the land that I'm on today, which is unceded territory of Kumaya, Tipai, Ipai people, beautiful sacred land. And it's uh, currently known and still colonized as San Diego. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. I am coming today from Los Angeles, and I recognize that I occupy land originally and still inhabited and cared for by the Tongva and Kisa peoples. I honor and pay respect to their leaders and descendants as they continue their stewardship of these lands and waters. And as we get started today, we are so excited to already see so many of you sharing where you come from and what uh, campuses you represent in the chat. And we wanna encourage you to keep that going. We are really excited to have all of you here uh, with us in this discussion today. And if you happen to know um, the land acknowledgement of the space that you occupy, please do feel free to share that in the chat as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to thank CVC OEI for that warm introduction and getting us started today. Um, you already learned so much about both Jacqueline and I, but just <laughs> uh, to reiterate a little bit more about where we're coming from today, um, mm -hmm. in, addi in addition to uh, our physical location, a little bit more about our background. So again, my name is Brielle, and I am a communication studies uh, adjunct faculty member at several different community colleges throughout California. I've also taught with San Diego State and Cal State Channel Islands. And I also work as a um, 
instructional designer for UC Santa Cruz. You'll note that I represent per Peralta Community College in my profile here because I'm actually from Oakland and that's one of the first institutions where I ever got a job. So I will always forever be a Peralta Community College employee. Nice, thank you, Braille. And the introduction as well was wonderful. I am um, in San Diego and I see in the chat, there's a few City College folks. I'm an alum from City College. So big ups to all the folks um, from City College. I am currently a um, part-time but extremely essential professor at Southwestern College, also doing work for San Diego State and um, teaching folks about the the beauty and the power behind mindfulness, mental health and diversity because they're all connected. And we'll share much more about us in just a bit, um, but that's a little bit more about me. So to get us started, we are gonna start with an icebreaker. And I just wanna remind everyone, this is a sensitive topic, fun topic, creative topic, powerful topic, but we do want to be mindful that it's sensitive. So with the first part of the icebreaker, when you think of a syllabus, what comes to mind? And if you want to um, write it down on a piece of paper so you don't forget for later, if you want to type it in the chat, we'll definitely come back to it. But we'll give you a few moments to, to jot some stuff down. Yes, <laughs> I'm already seeing some of those first, those first ideas pop into the chat. Please keep them coming. And note that while Jacqueline and I are presenting, um, we may not always be able to bring our attention to the chat. Our facilitators mm -hmm. will help us with that. Um, yeah. But we really do encourage your contribution there because we will definitely keep a record of those questions and get back to you later if we can't now. Um, but yes, thank you. So much of this is like hitting right where I think um, a lot of us think about an, a syllabus. Um, mm -hmm. expectations. Um, I did see someone note maybe a little dry. Um, yes, yeah, setting up for accountability, course expectations. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Rules, policies, penalties. Mm -hmm. mm. Students mm. tune it out. Fantastic. Yeah. Mm. Well, hopefully after today, we think a little differently about syllabi. Um, but in, in sort of alignment with our theme and our topic today, um, we're curious as sort of, when you think about a syllabus, how do things like assumptions, mm -hmm. bias, white privilege, or stereotypes also factor in? So again, keeping mind, you know, keeping aware that this is a sensitive topic, um, we don't require anyone to participate in the conversation in the chat. But if you do have ideas you want to share, please put them there. Language and tone. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Policies. Mm. That might be punitive. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I'll pass experiences, conditioning, mm -hmm. support, wording. All of these. Yes. Yes. Accommodations, for sure. Or Real, maybe the lack like, of accommodations. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say, it sounds like folks just came ready. Um, yeah. Brainstorming it usually takes time, but we are doing a deep dive. Absolutely. Yeah. We're certainly in the right room because um, we are expecting all of you to continue to share um, your ideas um, because yeah. although this is a topic we're really passionate about, no one's an expert. Um, and so it's really important to hear what comes to mind for other folks. Um, but in general, one of our goals today is to empower you all to, you know, really embrace and recognize that having a DEI lens to your syllabus or adding that to your syllabus or having that when you create it or update it can really help. It can make a difference, not just with the document, but with the experience of every student in your classroom. Yeah. And so to that end, we want to take a moment to uh, provide some definitions just to make sure we're all on the same page when we talk about D-E-I-A. Yes. So let's discuss these definitions. I am sure everyone that's on here with us have heard before, but we're going to unpack and some of the unpacking may be difficult and uncomfortable. But again, as Brielle said, we're all here collectively um, in unity and to learn from each other. So Again, I just want to be mindful of anything that may come up. Um, 
diversity still to this day continues to be a topic that some folks don't want to talk about, right? And some folks don't think that we need to have an equitable syllabus or curriculum or classroom. And today we're really going to talk about all the reasons on why it's so important. So diversity focuses on values and the way in which people differ. Equity. Equity, equity, equity. You will hear me repeat that word throughout the webinar today. That focuses on providing access and resources to historically excluded groups. Inclusion, bringing traditionally excluded individuals or groups into processes, activities, and decision or policy making in a way that shares power. And last but not least, the anti-racist, anti-racism actively opposing racism and the unfair treatment of people or groups, replacing old systems or policies with, with an equity lens. I wanna pause for a moment and share a powerful quote by Audre Lorde. It's not our differences that divide us. It is our inability to recognize, accept and celebrate those differences. It's just taking a moment of all the students that we serve, all the populations that we work with, remembering all the conditioning and trauma that they have experienced, and then our conditioning and trauma that we come in with. Brielle, did you want to add anything? Okay. Ooh, so who we are and the why behind our work. Um, as you shared a little bit about our background, we're going to share a little bit more. So I became passionate as in this topic, being a mixed race person. And even before understanding what that even meant, knowing that the system was broken, being a student in this system, being conditioned for, I don't know, let's say the first 20 years of my life, transitioning into being an educator, knowing that I wanted to be the type of teacher that I did not get to experience. Knowing and understanding why diversity, equity, and inclusion is so important in the classroom. And then also knowing that having background and certificates and degrees and knowledge about a topic is one thing, but really showing up and practicing what we preach and checking our biases at the door, it's something totally different. Um, that is a brief on why I do this work and why I'm passionate about sharing the importance of having an equitable syllabus, curriculum, classroom. Um, so that's a little bit about my why. Thanks, Jacqueline. You're welcome. And I'll share a little bit more about my why too. Um, I also identify as a mixed race person, um, but I'm uh, primarily of African and Filipino descent. And I grew up in the Bay Area and I was raised among a family of educators who all worked in public education. So I grew up with this um, really strong appreciation for education and um, the Bay Area is a very diverse environment. And so I saw those things as hand in hand. School is a place where everybody belongs and everyone can be included. As I got older, I started to experience school a little differently. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps my understanding of my own identity just, uh, just also started to transform. And mm -hmm. I became a little bit more enlightened about what it really means to participate in education as a person of color. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, it's funny because my, my parents used to say, you know, don't work in education. It's, it's hard. You're, you're going to have a tough life if you do. But I always saw that they came home, you know, tired, but fulfilled. And mm -hmm. that they were doing meaningful work. And so those seeds just planted so early for me. So as I was having those revelations um, with my own experiences, I wanted to find ways to help create further change and really continue their legacy. Um, and I learned more and more about DEIA along that journey, um, ended up going into graduate school and later becoming a teacher. And it was as a teacher that I really started to think about, okay, so what can I be doing in my personal classroom to make sure my students feel more included? And um, every single day when I'm in the classroom with, with my students um, or in a classroom and environment, I really do think back to that little girl um, in my experiences when I was younger and always wanting school to be a fun place where everyone can feel embraced. Um, so I really try to bring that in and cre recreate that for my students on their journey. Mm -hmm. So that's a little so, bit about why 
we do the work that we do. Um, and we don't have a ton of time today. We would love to hear your why. Like, why are you here today on a Friday? You could be doing so many other things. Your tummy's <laughs> probably growling. Um, but you're here with us. And we want to mm -hmm. give you a moment to just honor and think about what it is that drew you to this, to this webinar. Mm -hmm. Who are you, right? What, what identity and positionality are you coming to this webinar with? And who are your students? What is the demographic background of the students that you interact with on your campus or online? Are you new to DIA? Maybe you came here with a really strong sense of curiosity. What questions do you have? Keep those in mind. Perhaps there will be an opportunity for you to jot them down or to, to mm -hmm. offer them in the chat. We'd love to help address any questions that come up. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you're an expert or someone very experienced in the realm of DIA and we're curious about how you have taken what you've learned and applied it to your syllabus and your courses. What are you already doing to make sure that your class is inclusive? A couple other questions that we'd like to plant are, how are students co-creators of your course? But not only what are you doing, to make your classroom more inclusive, but how are you giving students the opportunity to contribute to that inclusivity, giving them some opportunity to also create space? What content mm -hmm. are you using in your courses? Whose voices are present or dominant? Whose voices could be added? Whose may be absent or you could add a little bit more? Mm -hmm. How are you helping your students grow? Are you growing? Mm -hmm. Finally, how do you even know what your students need? When you're thinking about creating a more inclusive classroom or syllabus, mm -hmm. where is that information coming from? So some things for you to think about. Um, I'm not sure if the slides will be shared after this webinar, so feel free to take a click of the screen if these are questions that really spark interest for you and something you want to revisit later. Um, but we just want you to kind of keep the answers to these questions in the back of your mind as we move forward. And I just want to, I was going to say, uh, Brielle, yes, take a, a screenshot, but I just saw in the chat, the slides will be shared. So no worries if you did not get to that. Oh, good. Wonderful. So Good. integrating DEIA into your syllabus, so many things. We only have one hour together today, but we're going to give you the gems that have worked best for us and add some more to that, as well as hearing all of your comments. Okay, so we're going to get into more definitions. Decolonization, another word that... Um, has been shared lately. However, it's not a new word at all. And it has a lot of um, trauma within that word. So being mindful when we talk about decolonizing the curriculum, decolonizing the classroom, and in this particular case, decolonizing our syllabus. The ultimate goal is to help you decolonize your syllabus and course. So let's look at what decolonization means. The process of challenging and undoing challenging and undoing colonizing practices that have influenced education in the past and are still present today in our books, in our data, in our research, and just the way that some people teach, right? This includes rethinking, reframing, and reconstructing curricula and research that preserve a colonial lens. Now, pausing, I want to invite you to think about a few key points. Having a critical self-reflection, so for example, answering or tapping into some of the questions from the previous slide, thinking about your own empathy and how you share that empathy with students, racial literacy, cultural competence and humility, cultural responsive um, pedagogy, feminist and anti-racist pedagogy. All of these key points can also help you create a more equitable syllabus. Thank you, Jacqueline. You're so welcome. just to kind of go um, big picture once again for everybody, when we think about decolonizing our syllabi, we really wanna kind of think about like the transformation that we're looking to see. 
right? So drawing on some of what you already contributed in the chat, when we typically think of a syllabus, we're thinking about something that maybe is a little stale, probably doesn't have a ton of vibrance or personality. There's a lot of acronyms often used in mm -hmm. syllabus, syllabi, um, a lot of inside baseball jargon that students are probably not familiar with. There's often a punitive tone mm -hmm. as syllabi often get really in detail about what not to do and what will happen if you do it. And they kind of read like a manual. <laughs> so when we've enacted the practices that we're going to talk about more, what we end up with is a document that incorporates way more inclusive values and voices. It's more humanized. It has more of that personality and particularly your personality, you the teacher. It involves student friendly language. So language that students can grasp. If you have to use that acronym, gotta go ahead and explain it so that they understand what it means and unpack it. Um, mm -hmm. Because sometimes it, just giving the you know spelled out version of the acronym still sounds pretty jargony, right? Mm -hmm. So using that student friendly language um, to provide context for why it is that you're referring to such and such a program or policy. Really important. At the end of your process, your syllabus should be a guide for how to be successful, mm -hmm. right? Not just talking about what we don't wanna see, what we shouldn't do, but what you can do to really get the most out of this course and take that learning with you out into the rest of your day, your life, your career, mm -hmm. take it home to your family. It should read less like a manual and mm -hmm. more like a welcome letter, right? It's often the mm -hmm. first thing students see when they come into your classroom, whether that's online or in person, it's one of those very first items, right? On the agenda. Um, and you really want it to be something that gets people excited to be, to be there. So Absolutely. getting into our last, definition for today. <laughs> we promise. Thank you, Brielle. Yeah. So we talked about DEIA. We talked about decolonization. Now, last but not least, a word that a lot of people don't want to talk about, especially when we're talking about curriculum and syllabi, anti-racism. So decolonizing requires an anti-racist approach. Being racist or anti-racist is not about who you are. It's about what you do. And I'm going to read that sentence one more time because I just want everyone to, to absorb it. And in, in maybe you're rereading it twice or three times yourself. Being racist or anti-racist is not about who we are. It's about what we do. Making sure that we're checking our biases as soon as, not even walk into our classroom, but as soon as we drive on or walk onto campus to remember that we have certain privileges that our students don't have, right? And that's where the mindfulness and that awareness piece comes in. Anti-racism, here's a definition, actively working against white supremacy, white dominant culture, and in excuse me, in inequitable institutions and society, anti-racism is making conscious decisions to make frequent, consistent, and equitable choices in personal practices and structural policies. What does that even mean, right? What does it mean when we have our own biases? What does it mean when we bring our own culture, our own identity, maybe our own religious religion or past thoughts we all come in with our own biases, but being mindful to be aware of those biases and checking the biases at the door. Openly acknowledge all types of racism in the course, whether they're internalized, intrapersonal, institutional, or structural, and then express, ex, express anti-racist ideas, engaging in anti-racist practices, and support anti-racist practices. Very, very important to again, go back to the self-reflection question. Thanks, Jacqueline. So, you know, you're probably already aware or at least now getting the sense that there's a lot of self-reflection and deep thought that goes into creating a more equitable space in your classroom. And the syllabus is just one piece of that. And to give you all some sort of 
practical things that you can take away with you today. We wanted to focus um, a big portion of our discussion on three major sections of the syllabus and how you can revise them. So everything we've already mentioned, those are seeds that we wanna plant that you we help you take with you and grow and let them bloom and blossom throughout the rest of your careers. These next, uh, these three sections that we're gonna focus on are things that you can go and implement in the next hour or two in your syllabus and make a difference, but it's just a start, right? It's just a scratch on the surface. There's so much other work that needs to be done internally um, and it's a process, right? Um, but if you're mm -hmm. anxious to like get started with some deliverables on that process, this next little portion is for you. Um, so the three sections that we're gonna focus on revising with a DEI -A lens are the course description, which is a, a major component of, of every syllabus, right? It's always there, usually at the very beginning. The communication <laughs> plan, right? People have different terms for that, but there's often a section where you explain how you will communicate, how to get in touch with you as an instructor. And then that policy section, right? Which is like probably like the last 10 pages of that super long syllabus that we all have. Um, so those are the three sections we're going to focus on. And to give you kind of a preview of where we're going with this, we are going to talk about revising them and adding to them. Mm -hmm. So in your course description, if you don't already have it, we're going to encourage you to add a diversity and inclusion statement. In your communication plan, if you don't already have it, we're going to encourage you to add an about me section. And that's you we're talking about, about you. Mm -hmm. And then finally, with the policy section, adding a resources section. All right, let's dive in. Wonderful. Thank you, Brielle. And just to go back to the three points that we're going to unpack more today, remembering that the students are human and they want to get to know you on a personal level. And they also want to be able to feel comfortable when they're contacting you. And I want to go, um, can we go back to the previous slide for just a moment, Brielle? Thank you. For the policies, resources, remembering that our students are parents, our students sometimes take care of um, siblings, maybe they take care of grandparents. So including things like community resources, basic needs, mental health and wellness. And if you already don't have those in the syllabus, to make sure to add those in because that may be the only place that a student may be able to, may be able to receive or even see that information. And it just takes one sentence for that student to make that connection or to make a call or send an email so they don't have to have experience food insecurity, or so they may need um, to be able to connect with a therapist or counselor on campus. So I just wanted to add that piece under the policy section. So for the course description, share what is unique about the way you teach this course. So again, humanizing, personalizing, letting them know your why. Did you attend a community college? Why are you passionate about this? Students don't always wanna hear about your degrees and certifications and how much experience that you have. Some may care, most don't. They wanna know your why. They wanna make sure that you're genuine. And students wanna make sure that you are walking the walk, that you are showing up, that you're being unapologetic and that you're being genuine. And students could pick up on that and they are able to respect you and build a rapport with you when they feel comfortable with you. Then also adding what's fun about this course, right? I always tell students about psychology and diversity and how powerful and beautiful the science of the mind is. And then I give them examples why. What uh, should they start thinking about now in order to be successful later? I know in our syllabus, we have our due dates and our midterms and our finals. And what happens if we um, find someone with plagiarism and now we have to add an AI se section, but much more than that, how can we help students so they can be successful? A semester goes by really fast. Now we're in week, I think six or seven, and there's like nine or 10 weeks to go. I feel like just yesterday, the semester started. So how do we set students up for success? Maybe adding, adding tutoring times or talking about the library, which some students never step foot into or visit, reminding them of the benefits of all the, uh, excuse me, resources that we have on campus. 
And then last but not least, telling students why, excuse me, how they can apply for the information in the course, in their everyday lives, and why it matters. That application piece is very, very important, and it also increases the buy-in on why the information that we're sharing with our students is so important, and not just so they could check off a box when they go see their counselor or to transfer to a university, but how the skills and the knowledge that we're showing um, and sharing with them today can help them for their lifelong journey. Yes, thank you. You're so. Welcome. Again, this is all about adding personality, right? Um, but you also want to really set the tone in your course description for um, what you expect students to gain from the course and how you expect them to contribute to the course in that description. And so it's important that you have some version of a diversity and inclusion statement along with your course description. And this is your opportunity to be really forthcoming and transparent about your commitment to DEIA and how you plan to work together with your students to uphold these values. So another sort of subsection could be a code of conduct, right? And when I have, um, and in my first week of instruction, I like to co-create this with my students. So I actually don't have a code of conduct in my syllabus. What we do is we spend a whole class hour talking about what makes you feel most respected in communication and in um, and inclusivity with regards to how you experience class and feel most supported by your classmates and your teacher. And because that can be kind of touchy, I give students post-its. They can write their ID on a post-it, don't have to put their name on it, and we put it on a wall. And then we read them all and we put them into categories so that we can have a set of ground rules. Um, that incorporate that are um, mm -hmm. supplemental to this diversity and inclusion statement. Some low hanging fruit that might be tempting for you to grab is that diversity and inclusion statement that your college has. By this point, pretty much every institution has this on their website. If they don't uh, get on a committee and make it happen, <laughs> um, it's important to have right for legal reasons, but also for those setting the tone right and expectations. Absolutely. We're asking you to move beyond what the college says, though. It's wonderful to paste that into your syllabus and say mm -hmm. such and such college upholds this value. But your students are going to be much more interested in your reason for why diversity and inclusion matter and how you plan to uphold that in the classroom. So don't just lean on the institutional policy. Really try to personalize that message and as we've offered, maybe you co-construct some of that with your students in the first week of school, lay the ground rules so everybody knows like, hey, this is how we're showing up for each other. And I guarantee they're gonna be that much more willing to participate having been a part of that process. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you, Brielle. Mm -hmm. And adding on to that is the communication plan. Students today are not like they were 20 years ago when we were in college. So not just explaining to them how to reach out, but share how you plan to communicate with your students. Something that I love to share with my students uh, when it comes to the communication plan is teamwork, which I saw some folks in the chat write, uh, write in. And then also I have students that create a, um, for students that cross the border because we are um, a few miles away from the binational border and TJ here in San Diego, they do a WhatsApp through WhatsApp or they do a group text to help each other keep up with communication and also for accountability. The second one is one of my ultimate favorite. When I was in college, there was only one way to talk to the professor and that was before class, after class, and we were fortunate if they had office hours and if they were even there during those office hours. And I just never forget that. That's a memory that stays. And I made a promise to never be that type of teacher. So with that, making sure that to offer different modalities, right? So you could have in-person office hours via Zoom, text, if you're courageous, chat, um, a hybrid or a variety. I have some students that asked me if we could even do FaceTime if you have students that have um, the same type of phone that you have. But remembering that offering a wide variety of modalities to communicate also brings us to accessibility which is huge and accessibility and equity also go hand in hand. And then remembering that you may have to offer different office hours and different days. Maybe you're on campus Monday, Wednesday, but a student really needs to connect with you on a Friday. Maybe if your time allows, making that time to be on campus for one hour 
one Friday a month or whatever works for, for your schedule. But just remembering that our students um, are intersectional and they have children, they have jobs. Um, some have children, jobs, and go to school full time. Some may be in the military. So their schedules are so much more than just being a full-time student or part-time student. And again, um, showing them patience and grace. And last but not least, this just happened last week, providing an email template to help them with their communication skills. Uh, so for me, hey, or what's up when you're addressing me in an email doesn't work, right? But what if a student has never been taught on how to communicate or how to write a proper email or just have proper etiquette, reminding them that it's okay to say, hey, or what's up, but they may start with good morning, good afternoon, how are you? And then teaching them and showing them how to write a proper email template will take them far beyond the classroom because most likely they'll want to communicate with another teacher or when they send an email for a job or an inquiry or an internship. So these are, these are soft skills that um, a lot of the young people that we're working with in this generation just did not get and no fault of their own. So I also think part of our privilege and um beautiful duty and responsibility is to teach them how to communicate um, in addition to the, the subject matter that we're sharing with them. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. You know, that's one of my mm -hmm. favorite bullet points as a communication instructor. I'm like, let me give you a template. Let me give you something to work with. I know right? it is. <laughs> um, and it, it'll save you time later. It'll save you frustration. Um, and you yeah. can really lean on that. And like you said, it, it, it transcends your class right? You're giving mm -hmm. them a life skill, um, which is so important. All right. So we're heading into our final planned section as far as what you can revise in your syllabus today. Um, mm -hmm. But um, first, the, the addition to this section, we kind of already touched on, um, which is adding an about me section. So before mm -hmm. we talk about that last item we want to revise, let's just think about the communication plan and honestly, how often it isn't used right so many students of yours you never hear from right they never come to office hours whether or not they're doing well in the class is a totally different story but they've never really tried to build a relationship with you and you've never had an opportunity to connect with them well adding an about me section just before or after your communication plan can really change that Mm -hmm. Jacqueline mentioned earlier that a lot of times when we talk with students about our background and why we're teaching, we're talking about our degrees and all the institutions we've represented, but students mm -hmm. don't care about that. What's mm -hmm. going to be a far more interesting narrative and compelling reason to reach out to you mm -hmm. is your story as a student. Mm -hmm. If you're about me section, talk about your journey as a student, something they can relate to. Talk about that job you held on campus, talk about how you were juggling family struggle, talk about how you switched majors five times. <laughs> Let the students know that you can relate to their experience and they're gonna be far more likely to use that communication plan to show up to those office hours and build that relationship with you. And that is gonna have um, impact on the way you teach your class ever after. Because as we know from any time we have had a student come to office hours, it opens up your eyes, right? Hearing about their experiences is always a great reminder of ways that you can be flexible and empathetic with all of your students. And so we want to make sure that you're always getting that opportunity and your about me page or section in your syllabus is a really good um, place where you can establish that. It's also an opportunity for you to demonstrate and embody diversity, equity, and inclusion, and anti-racism. So in some of those personal notes that you add in your About Me section, speak beyond your academic experience as a teacher and as a student, and talk a little bit about your personal life. Talk about organizations you support. Perhaps you're someone that is an activist in your community. Let your students know um, that you're out here fighting the fight, um, or find other ways to illustrate your acts of inclusion in your everyday life. Right. And it's delicate. Right. You don't want to sound like you're being so obvious. Oh, look at me and all the things that I do to support others. Right. But it's important for students to know if you're an ally. Right. That is good information for them to have to know that you're a safe space. So really try to illustrate that and give students a reason to reach out to you and want to connect with you. 
I love that, Brielle. I just want to pause for a moment because I know we're sharing a lot of information. There's a lot of data and, and comments and questions in the chat, which um, I look forward to seeing. Um, but just being human, I just cannot um, emphasize that enough, being human. I still talk to students and professors alike, and there's this division, right? Um, that the, the teacher is just up here and the student is here. And I would like to invite everyone that's spending time with us now as we create an equitable syllabus to make sure that we're, maybe some folks are not gonna like the word I say, but friends, right? We're equal. I'm not here uh, to be better than you or that I may know even more than you, maybe in the subject matter, right? Because I took the class and I'm teaching it now, but to really remind you that I am a person. I also have life alive, things come up. I may have a child. I may have a partner. I may have family. I might also work, you know, three jobs. And back to what Brielle's point, reminding them that we too were students. We know that it's hard out there and that speaks volumes. Um, so I just can't say enough how important is the humanizing piece, um, which all comes together with diversity, equity, inclusion, um, and anti-racism. So now moving on to the course policies, my goodness, we all have our own course policies, but let's talk about the first one, including essential campus policies, but introduce them with your own language. Being mindful that if we're gonna talk about diversity, equity and inclusion and anti-racism and decolonizing, being mindful that some of the language in the syllabus may activate or trigger some students. If we've talked about something like campus police, which is there for the safety of everyone on campus, including our students, maybe being mindful of the way that we write that sentence or that paragraph, because we may have some students in our class that may have had negative experiences with law enforcement or police before. Being mindful that the language that we use when we're talking about course policies is also inclusive. And being mindful that we may have second language learners in our class and they're reading our syllabus for the first time. So maybe translating, I'm not saying translate the entire syllabus. I'm not saying if you don't know how to speak a different language, um, making your job harder. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying that now we have a lot of resources, even picking something up like our phone and using Google Translate, that if a student needs help understanding language in the syllabus, especially under course policies, taking that extra step to helping them understand. Message your own policies with empowerment in mind. I also want to add with encouragement in mind. Empowerment and encouragement um, are also like cousins or best friends um, is how I like to describe it. So reminding them that though this is a legal document, this is a love letter, as I like to share with my students, a, a help in, during the semester. And it has a lot of information. They don't have to read it all at once, but they could go back and forth to the pages that they need. And then consider where there's gray area and explain the options. I saw something in the chat at the beginning of our webinar. Someone said a liquid syllabus. I know that folks are using a QR code for a syllabus now. The syllabus doesn't have to be 20 to 50 pages long, but making sure that number one, it's equitable. Number two, it's easy to understand. And number three, that you have the most important and beneficial information. And remember, Folks don't like to read, right? So how do we get the information on the syllabi in a way that it's easy to understand, that it's going to empower, encourage, and also offer all the resources? Um, do I think that could take some work to create? Absolutely. Do I think that it's, it has many benefits and it'll be, it'll be a good advantage for our students? Yes, I do. So just some things. Um, to keep in mind and definitely not overwhelm anyone. Um, Briella and Jacqueline, a few people are asking if you guys would be sharing um, uh, syllabus, and I see there's a lot of interest in that. So I'm, um, that's just a question that came up. And where I'm sorry, I did not hear the the first part. Could you repeat, please? Oh, you're muted, Anwar. But she's asking, people are asking if um, if you will be sharing one of your syllabus. We're happy to. Uh, sorry, Brielle, I just yeah. said we're answering for you. 
Yeah. Um, later on in the, in the at the end of the deck, we do provide our contact information so you can follow up with us um, and we'll work with the coordinators at the CDC to make sure that um, these resources are shared. Absolutely. Um, yes. Speaking of resources. So thank you, Jacqueline. Um, you know, that policy page, like you said, it can be triggering. It can be really <laughs> triggering. And so often it's the dominant portion of the syllabus. So we really mm -hmm. encourage you to sprinkle in with those policies, the resources that can help mm -hmm. students avoid needing that policy in the first place, mm -hmm. right? How can they be successful? Mm -hmm. And as awesome. we alluded to before, go beyond campus support. So it is important to point to the library because it's an underutilized resource oftentimes for students. Um, mm -hmm. But not only the physical library, but also point to that online library or database because so many of our students are commuter mm -hmm. students. So make sure they know how they can access that resource from home. And yeah. think about other things beyond what a student needs maybe in just your course. Mm -hmm. um, or ways mm -hmm. in which you can help students with um, being um, professional and getting their goals achieved in general. So we mentioned before the communication uh, uh, email template, right? That's one resource you can offer students. Something mm -hmm. I've been telling students about um, are um, places that they can study that are close to campus. Mm -hmm. Right. Sometimes students want to get off campus and they want to have another place that they can go study where they're not going to be bothered, where the Wi-Fi is free and no one's going to hassle them if they're on their computer. So I point mm -hmm. students to those other places off campus where they can get work done. That's also a really great resource for students that have to do group work. Right. Think about mm -hmm. how you can help make that group that required group project a little bit easier to achieve mm -hmm. by giving students resources. Uh, John mentioned earlier, health and then counseling um, services yes. on campus as well as off campus, right? Mm -hmm. Things within mm -hmm. the community that students need, particularly our students that are, you know, facing a lot of challenges and obstacles perhaps in their personal life. This might be their only opportunity to get that information. The colleges mm -hmm. that we represent often have a lot of these services in place. But as we know, students come to class and they leave. They don't always mm -hmm. spend time on campus and get to learn about that. Your syllabus mm -hmm. and your classroom are one of the main places that they're going to turn to when they need support. And this document can really aid in that. Mm. Um, I like to give just general tips for success, too. Um, I have interview ass assignments for my students because um, I think it's important for them to go out and talk to people. I teach communication studies, so that kind of comes with the territory. Um, but I give them tips on how to ask somebody to participate in an interview. And I give them sample questions that they can go out and ask so that they're not starting from scratch. And then I ask mm. them and, and, and prompt them to write a thank you letter after mm -hmm. they've had that interview with somebody to let them know how grateful they are for their time and how this is going to be integrated into their coursework right so that's giving them the that much more opportunity to be successful in that assignment um, as you'll see in the screenshot here i also provide time management tips right because mm -hmm. so much of being a student is just time management and really life right um, so another mm -hmm. one of those soft soft skills that you can support with just you know strategic placement in your syllabus and Jacqueline and I want to encourage you to go beyond offering mm -hmm. resources in your syllabus and mimicking mm -hmm. the placement of some of those resources elsewhere in your course. It's going to come up later, but one of the things we want to encourage you not to do is over rely on your syllabus because it is one of those documents that even after you put all of this glorious effort and time into is something that some students will not revisit after that first initial viewing. And so it's important that that link to the library and that information about how to, you know, co properly conduct an interview is offered and embedded in the assignment instruction. So students mm -hmm. are reminded, oh, that's right. I can just go to the library online. Oh, or that's mm -hmm. right. Miss Erica mentioned that coffee shop. Let's go there and do the group work. Right. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned it in the syllabus, but I just copy and paste that same little blurb and put it right there in the assignment when it's relevant. Um, and we call that sort of like a just-in-time resource. Um, mm -hmm. And it's going to save you time, honestly. And it doesn't take much time to just copy-paste. You've already written in your syllabus. Why not sprinkle that love all over the rest of your course? I love that. Uh, Brio, I just want to add one thing that just added a smile Please. to my heart. Mm -hmm. 
talking about an equitable syllabus, reminding students of the resources, because it's one thing to not have accessibility. It's one thing to face financial hardship, which a lot of our students do, but reminding them that they have gold at their fingertips if they just go into the library per se. And I, and I saw someone um, make a comment, but it went away in the chat about the library, just in the library alone, right? Not only are there the books for data and research and pleasure reading, but there's computers for the students that may not have access to a PC or a laptop at home, or maybe only doing their work on their phone or a tablet or iPad. Um, there's the printer, there's paper, there's pencils, there's a quiet and safe place to sit down. Right. So keeping in mind all things equity and diversity and inclusion, remembering that having a safe space, having a place to print, having a place to ask a librarian a question all have to do with equity. Um, and sometimes we forget. Right. Because, you know, we've been there, done that. We know how to utilize the library. We have an apartment or a home to do our homework or to do our reading. But a lot of our students don't. And that's just um, something that I wanted to bring up. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, there's there's so much we want to add. Oh, <laughs> um, there's not enough time. <laughs> there's not enough time. Um, but we do uh, hope that what we just offered as far as thinking about those sections in the syllabus give you some actionable things you can go out and do now to improve your syllabus or just rethink some of the items in your syllabus. Mm -hmm. um, and we are going to transition now to talking about some other things that you can do beyond your syllabus and integrating some of what we've already talked about in the rest of your um, pedagogy and how you construct your courses. Before we do that, um, we want to give everyone in the chat an opportunity to just throw other things in the chat um, about the syllabus in particular, because we are going to kind of move beyond that. But are there other practices that you all have um, mm -hmm. put into place to make sure that your syllabi are have that DEIA lens? Please share them in the chat. We want to make sure that um, all of the knowledge in this webinar is captured um, beyond just what we have to share in the deck. Mm. Student oh, hours rather than that. office hours. Reframing. I love, yeah. I love that. I, I just want to say that. I just got to read an entire Take chat message. Up. <laughs> Taking it. Yes. Out. Student hours. Talk about being student-centered and language. Yes. Yeah. Oh, hyperlids. The liquid Ooh. syllabus I see has come up quite a bit. I think including to hyperlinks to go straight to contact mm -hmm. information. Yes. Mm -hmm. I really mm -hmm. want to um, highlight that and, and kind of piggyback on something Jacqueline mentioned about, you know, students that are using their phones for the course. Um, really thinking about how you can make sure your courses are mobily accessible to students because more and more students are relying on a smartphone or a tablet to get their right. coursework done. Um, laptops mm -hmm. are becoming pretty pretty outdated and antiquated, mm -hmm. honestly. Mm -hmm. um, and they're a lot more expensive than that phone. So thinking about ways that you can ensure that your course is um, phone friendly is a mm -hmm. fabulous, fabulous practice. It takes time, but that time is well spent. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm. I see. So <laughs> I love that. Let them know mm -hmm. you're paid to be there. Come. Come make me earn, help me earn some money. I love that. And yeah, you know what's another that. great thing to have? Um, and if and if you if you have the means, is using some um, you know five ten dollars that you got to put a little bowl of candy or some granola bars or fruit in your office and letting students know, come on by and grab a snack, right? Water I, bottles. Yeah. I shouldn't say candy. Wait, we want to be nutritious, but obviously candy brings people in the door. Um, but if you want to have things like granola, <laughs> yes, if you want to have things like granola bars, fruit, um, and other healthy snacks, mm -hmm. anything um, that can just, you know, help improve the student's day a little bit. Tell them, you don't have to come and talk to me about class, but come on by and grab something so that you have sustenance to get through your day. Um, that's a great thing to offer in your office hours, and it will get people in the doors. I love that, Brielle. Okay. I do that. I do that. And um, though that took us to a very high vibration, I also want to share with everyone, some students, that may be the only snack or food they get to eat that day. So again, equity, right? Talking about being equitable in all our ways. 
because the syllabus is not just one. We're, we're whole teachers, we're whole professors. The syllabus is just one part. So if we have an equitable syllabus, we'll have an equitable curriculum, we'll be an equitable person. Um, I'm very optimistic because I believe in the work that we do. And I also know that you believe in the work that we do because you're spending your precious time um, engaging in this conversation. So yes to candy and snacks and chocolate and apples and all that, so. <laughs> yes, all right. So please do keep your ideas coming in the chat as they come to you. Um, yes. We're gonna kind of offer some additional tips now um, for mm -hmm. other things you can do to elevate your course in general. Um, so I'll, I'll let you take this next slide, Jacqueline. Sure, thank you, Brielle. Ooh, we've been talking about being human and personal and students getting to know us, being transparent. We're all adults. And I saw someone put in the chat, community college students come in all ages. Absolutely. I have a 17 year old and I have a 69 year old in one of my classes this semester. Talk about having four generations in one space. Um, I have to show up as genuine in front of my 69 year old, the same way I would show up in front of the 17 year old and speaking the same way, right? Because, well, I'll save that comment for a, a few more slides down, but showing up, being transparent and being holistic. So what does that mean? Offering context, sharing the dark side um, and any bias about our topic, not glossing over it, discussing it openly. If there is something that may trigger or activate someone, I always uh, share with my students that to please take care of themselves and their mental health first. So maybe they need to step outside for a few moments of that lecture. Um, but very, very important that we show up authentically, that we show up in a genuine way. Um, and by us being free and shining, we give them the permission to be free and to shine in the class. So it works. Uh, mirror and centering your audience. This creates um, a place where students can see themselves, right, in our course and lead with those images and examples. Um, hopefully when we're all using our PowerPoints and different videos and discussion, having diversity when we show pictures, having diversity when we show images, having diversity in the way that we show up and that we speak. Um, avoiding assumptions, one of the golden rules to never assume um, lesson content to the never assume that the lesson content and the language that we use in instructions, being mindful of the word choice, language is so powerful. So remember, when we're speaking, are we being inclusive? Are we practicing equity? Um, are we serving just one population? Maybe again, I work in a um, Hispanic serving institution. So sometimes when I use different jargon, a lot of students may not understand that, especially when you translate something from English to Spanish, it doesn't come out the same all the time. So being mindful that when we're presenting our lesson plans, when we're writing our, our syllabus, excuse me, that it's not ignoring any of our students. I don't care if it's just one, we wanna make sure the document is crystal clear for everyone reading it. And then, of course, making sure that we're following the law, using an accessibility checker, and um, being 508 compliant. I want to share um, something that's not on the slide, but I'm happy to email it out um, to anyone that um, would like. Remembering that cultural competence when creating an equitable syllabus is an ongoing process. You're not just going to attend this one webinar or take another class and be an expert in creating an equitable syllabus, right? It's an ongoing process. And I believe that Brielle um, shared this before. The more you learn, the more sections you're gonna add and you're gonna edit and you're gonna delete. This is a live document. Um, being mindful to include intersectionality, empathy. And I know I talked about being um, having empathy earlier, privilege and oppression, cultural and intellectual humility, and lack of diversity in the profession. All these things come to mind when we speak to our students. Um, so if they could just have a document that could also reflect a safe space, that will speak volumes and that will also increase engagement. Um, so wanted to share that with you. 
Thank you, Jacqueline. Before I move on to the next slide, and just so you all know, we only have about three or four more, uh, I don't even think three more slides of, of content before we open it up for more questions. Um, yeah. I want to I want to hone in on that last point just a little bit about follow the law. So that was sort of just like a catchy way to say like something you need to do. But we do also want to emphasize that ensuring that your course is accessible for those who might be vision impaired or those who might have trouble with hearing or any other challenges or learning diversity um, uh, experiences that might be present in your classroom is crucial. Right. It is part of the law. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of buzz around campus on making sure that we follow that law because a lot of schools are starting to invest in training in this area. But it's really for the empowerment of every student. Right. Having a video that's captioned doesn't just help those that have challenges with their hearing. Right. It helps every student. It helps with literacy. It helps with spelling. It helps with attention. Right. So there's tons of reasons why you should be thinking about accessibility in your courses and designing your courses and all of the material of your courses so that they are accessible for a screen reader and that every student can really take in the knowledge that you're offering. So I want to just note that although some of these points were going over them quickly, we mean each one of them wholeheartedly and there's a lot to them. Um, and we do have one more slide with a couple of more tips um, from this big picture of what you can be doing for your classroom. So um, a huge one, lower the cost, right? Students have paid to enroll in your course. <laughs> they shouldn't have to pay anything else, right? They already are a student. They made it into the, uh, the college um, as a paying student or someone with financial aid. The cost should stop there when possible, right? So if you can, Try to find a primary text that is OER friendly, open educational resource, or in some other ways, mm -hmm. cost reductive for the students. And if you cannot get around that, be very upfront about it. So students know when they walk in the door, hey, this is the material that we need for this course. I wish it was cheaper. Here's what it is. Let me know how I can make this possible for you. Let me know how you can share that book with a student. Let's figure out a buddy system. Um, and just, you know, let students know up front what, what kind of costs they're, costs they're gonna incur and ways around mm -hmm. it um, and try to create some ways around it if you can. Showcase mm -hmm. diversity. So in that selection of that textbook or any other media involved in your course, be mm -hmm. sure to include diverse representations in authorship and perspective. Right, we mentioned in the previous slide, it's important to be transparent about perhaps maybe some areas of your field that have a bit of a dark side, right? Maybe there's not a huge, um, his, there's not a lot of historical evidence of people of color perhaps contributing to this field of study. Hopefully that's changed. Find examples of that change and bring them into your course or talk about it with your students. How can we build a pipeline so that our field of study that we love so much can touch more lives and get more get more perspectives, right? So try to create and showcase diversity and talk about it if it's not there. Mm -hmm. Be predictable. So this is a tricky mm -hmm. one. Um, this is really coming from my mind as an instructional designer. You know, when we build courses, particularly when we build them online, we try to have a really similar cadence with what's being offered module by module, right? I'm thinking about Canvas. Um, you wanna balance the workload of each unit and section of your course so students kind of know, okay, I've been given these assignments. I did these last week for the same teacher. It's gonna take me about X amount of time, right? Try to even out that expectation for students. Provide easy to understand titles and instructions. So the label of an, the title of an assignment should be really easy for a student to grasp. Oh, hey, okay, that's an interview assignment. I'm going to go out to, I'm going to have to go out and meet people and talk to people. I'm going to need time for that, right? If you bury the lead and you don't give students a cue when they're looking at the assignment title or the lecture title as to what kind of work is going to be required, they become at a disadvantage right away. Maybe you even offer an expected time range at the bottom of a lecture or at the beginning of a lecture so students know, hey, this is this is gonna be a long one, friends, right? This is gonna take us the next three class periods, stick with me, right? Or, hey, this assignment coming up, it's not gonna be a one or two hour assignment. It's gonna be something that takes you a couple of hours, maybe five or six, depending, right? Give them that information, that intel to help them be um, successful. 
the way that you communicate with your students is also something that should have a relative cadence and be predictable. So my students know every Monday, they get a to-do list for the week. Every Wednesday, I'm checking in. Every Friday, I'm reviewing and recapping and telling them what's due on Sunday. Every week. I do teach a lot online. So Canvas, um, the LMS that I use, makes this really, really easy. Um, if you're using a different LMS or if you're teaching in person and you're looking for tips for how you can kind of streamline communication in this way, please reach out to me. I'm happy to help you think through that because it really does make a difference. Students should know what to expect from you just as you have your expectations of students. And then I mentioned it before, don't over rely on your syllabus, right? You've got all this great information in there and students come to you and they still ask you about the policy and they still you ask you about the, you know, can I turn this in late? And you're just shaking your head like, come on now, it's in the syllabus, right? Um, but it is your job to help that student understand and reiterate those policies and reiterate anything else in your course rather than just pointing them back to the document, right? So we want you to put time and effort into this document and strategically bring it up for students and remind students that it's there, but don't over rely, over rely on it because you're a human and students are going to connect with you more than they're going to connect with this document, hands down, no matter how much work you put into it, right? Um, and it was mentioned in the chat earlier that some students might be less comfortable with social interaction in, in some cases, right? And you want to be sensitive to that. And that is a, an opportunity for you to say, hey, I know you can't make it to office hours, or maybe that's not something that, you know, is, is comfortable for you. Here's another way to reach me, or here's another way to get the information you need, right? So the syllabus can be sort of that alternative mode of communication or alternative way of relaying information to your students. But please don't over rely on it because it's not going to work for every student. Some students really are going to need to hear it from you, what they need to be doing and what the expectations are. So just don't over rely on it like we wouldn't over rely on any element of the course, right? We have all of these different pieces and resources to our courses for a reason. So take advantage of each one, um, but know that the syllabus is really important and can set the tone for so much of what goes on in your course. Our very last slide um, before we open it up for questions. Um, just a couple other tips for inclusive course design. And this is another one where we're kind of looking at the before and after. Um, so an exclusive course, a course that is not designed with DEIA in mind is very reliant on text. And a more inclusive course incorporates things like images and video. And again, those images and videos should be reflective of, of the diversity of our world, right? An exclusive course is one size fits all assignments. A more inclusive course gives students some options, right? Maybe you've got a couple of different prompts and they can choose between those prompts or a couple of different ways they can submit their answer, right? Or submit their uh, assignment. Maybe it's an essay, maybe it's also a slide deck, maybe it's also a podcast right? Giving some, some student, students some autonomy and how they share their learning and their knowledge is to everybody's empowerment. Exclusive courses have heavily weighted assignments only. Everything is just like a big deal, right? A more inclusive course has a mix of low stakes and high stakes assignments. So some formative assessments that are really kind of helping students learn as they're measuring their learning, and then those more summative assignments that are sort of milestones within your course at the midterm, at the final, right? But a mix, right? Students should be able to get some points as they're learning, in addition to getting points to show off what they've learned, right? Formative and summative assignments, having a blend. Exclusive cor courses are closed, and they're one way, teacher to student. Inclusive courses give students an opportunity to be part of the process. They invite them to give feedback and they invite them to collaborate, right? Multiple modes or multiple directions of communication all throughout the classroom. Exclusive courses are strictly subject-based, right? Hey, this is a communication course. That's all we're gonna talk about. Um, inclusive courses incorporate other skills and other subject areas. So. Communication is, is my area. Um, fortunately, communication touches everything. So we typically find ourselves talking about other subject areas within the course. But in addition to that, 
I try to give students the opportunity to self-reflect, to take on leadership responsibilities, and to practice teamwork, right? And teamwork doesn't mean a big, large group assignment, right? Large group assignments, are, I'm sure we have some mixed feelings in this space about what those really mean for students and the challenges that come with them. Teamwork can just be a 20 minute project that they work on together in a class, right? Giving students that opportunity to work on those skills in your classroom makes it very, a, a lot more inclusive, right? And then finally, exclusive courses avoid tough conversations and unknowns. Inclusive courses acknowledge bias and admit gaps and in information. And this being an inclusive setting, Jacqueline and I just want to take this moment to say thank you for being a part of this space. Thank you for letting us share what has worked well for us. This is not an exhaustive list. And we have our own knowledge gaps and biases that we bring to this topic. So we really do want to continue um, in the time that we have remaining to hear your questions, but also your suggestions, your thoughts, what's working well for you in the class. Before I turn it over to the audience, Jacqueline, if you have anything else you want to say before we kind of open it up, please. Yes, um, two things. I had an opportunity when you were going through the last slide to go through the comments in the chat. And I just want to say um, it just warmed my heart. So many folks are already practicing equity, diversity, and inclusion um, with an equity lens. And a lot of folks are also saying, you know what? I want to learn more. I want to be better, um, which to me, you know, as teachers, we're always students. And then I want to remind everyone that a syllabus is a value statement and it's a live document and it's going to forever change and grow and upgrade. Um, so that's, that's a, a pause there because I, definitely want um, questions, comments, um, a few kind of reminders, please complete the survey. It's very helpful to everyone involved in this process. Um, and also Brielle's and my information are there if you have any questions. Um, and we just have a few recommended resources, but there's tons, um, especially in the work that we do um, in, in diversity, equity, and inclusion. So um, Brielle, should we take folks that have their hand up first or how how should we do go about this? Yeah, I suppose that's um, that's a, a great way to get started. I'm, I'm turning to our CVC facilitators for any other best practices as the experts who lead these webinars all the time. Okay. Jacqueline and I are, are, are sort of guests in the in the house of CVC today. Um, so, yeah, um, however, where it makes sense. Definitely. So let me go ahead. Let me give some closing remarks for in case anybody needs to jump off. They have that information and then we can just stick around and answer. You guys can answer questions, um, you know, because I, I do see a hand already. So just some quick closing comments for everyone. Um, we thank you so much for attending. This was really great, ladies. Lots of great information. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, once again, please complete the survey. I'll drop the link again in the chat. Um, if you have any questions or if you have concerns about verification of attendance, feel free to uh, email us at uh, support at cvc.edu. I'll drop that in the chat as well. Um, and we hope that you register for future webinars. We do have a, a, a few other webinars coming up. I'll drop that link in the chat as well. And um, lastly, again, once a reminder again uh, for our survey. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop. Ladies, do you want me to go ahead and mod uh, moderate questions or do you wanna take over? You decide. I think we'll take you up on moderation. Awesome, all right. Yeah. <laughs> I see Marnie's hand up. So Marnie, would you like to unmute? Thank you. Uh, okay, um, so that the second to last slide was giving me, as a, as a onlooker, uh, was giving me some, the inclusive part, some of that was giving me some distress uh, as an autistic person. So uh, I don't remember all, all the stuff on the slide. Uh, I'm trying to remember what it was. The teamwork stuff. Are, are you talking about Marty? I'm sorry. Sorry, Marty. Are you talking about the slide that had the two sections? Yeah, the inclusive, inclusive and exclusive. exclusive. That yeah. So 
Uh, sure. Real. I think we need to rethink this whole thing about the teamwork part. Uh, sometimes uh, autistic people or some autistic people, obviously, not obviously, but we're all so different, but mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the teamwork part one-on-one -on -one can be fine, but groups can be intimidating and daunting. And I know this is supposed to be focused on a syllabus only, but the syllabus leads to this kind of thing about teamwork and all that. Uh, I can't remember anything. I don't remember specifically other things on that inclusive part, but see, it's inclusive uh, for, I mean, we understand the reason for that is because when we go out in the work world, we're going to be expected to be team players, et cetera. How can, you know, like I'm trying to work on how can I best present that to not just, uh, you know, neurodivergent, but also highly shy people. Um, how can I best present that kind of teamwork thing in such a way that makes them feel more comfortable? And this is a tough one. I've been working on it for over a decade. <laughs> so, uh, I just wanted to mention that. And I wish I, I could see that um, inclusive thing again, because there was something else, but I don't want to take up too much time. I really appreciate you guys uh, allowing me to speak about this because it's super, to me, it's very important, along with the all, the entire DEIA, especially the anti-racism, uh, kind of been mm -hmm. on cru crusade the past few years, but that's just yeah. me. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, you're welcome, Marnie. Brielle, um, I have a lot to say, but I know this was your slide. Do you want to chime in to, to that or... Yeah, I, I want to thank you, Marnie, for bringing um, your reaction to the slide and your and your thoughts about you know how some of these some of these tips may not work for every student um, to mine for us. Um, I think that that unique perspective and experience that you're offering is something we can all keep in mind, but it's also a superpower of yours and an opportunity for you to be uh, transparent with your students and saying you know if there's elements of this course or expectations of this course that maybe don't rub you the right way for any reason let's come and talk about it and let's see how we can find alternative ways for you to participate and I guarantee with those conversations and 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 it sounds like you've already done a lot of the thinking yourself new ideas will come forth I don't have a remedy right now particularly thinking about the group example because I too struggle with it right? Some semesters I assign group work and it goes off swimmingly and other semesters I assign group work and I see that certain students are struggling with this for one reason or another and I have to rethink, okay, how am I going to, how am I going to manage this this semester? And sometimes that's what it comes down to, mm -hmm. right? We try to have these standards and these policies and these ways of practicing teaching, but every semester is a little different because you get a different group of students, you get different personalities, mm -hmm. you get, get different learning, learning styles. Um, so I'll, I will think on that and invite you to email me because um, I'm sure more thoughts will come to mind with a little more opportunity to marinate on that. Um, but Jacqueline, if you have anything you want to add, I would love to hear. Yeah, actually, you know what? I'll take her up on, on an email as well, only because I know there are more questions and I also want to be mindful that everyone gets an opportunity to have a voice. All right, ladies. So uh, we have Camille. Uh, with her hand. Hi, thank you so much for all this great information. Um, here's what I would love, and I, I think I put this in the evaluation. I love all the content that you have, and I want to uh, lift up my colleague, gosh, T Tasha, uh, I put it in the chat. I, I, I apologize, I'm saying your name incorrectly, but I find that my colleagues in STEM, and I'm not picking on anybody, um, tend to, uh, I would like to find a way to bridge a lot of what you're talking about and help my colleagues in STEM in particular understand the difference between, not that they are not brilliant, but understand the difference between culturally responsive pedagogy and curriculum. I mm. think they use the two because they say, look, one plus one is always gonna be two. And I don't care if you do it with an accent with traditional clothing on, they get it confused, the difference between what your curriculum is, mm -hmm. right? Because they'll say ethnic studies, literature, y'all can all do that. I'm in math. 
I'm in chemistry. I'm in science. I don't, I don't see that there's opportunities for that. So I would love any instruction or any resources that you have and helping folks get that really clear that there's a difference between matters not what the curriculum is or what the content is, that yes. you can have culturally responsive, responsive pedagogy in your teaching. Yeah. So if you have any resources around that, I would love that. I would like to, um, Camille, answer that. And of course, Real, if you would like to chime in after. We had this exact same conversation this morning at the college when I was doing a diversity training. And um, two chemists and three scientists all raised their hand and they said, how do we do this in our... And again, nothing to take away from their brilliance because they're extremely genius, but we don't talk about bringing diversity, equity, inclusion and anti-racism in the STEM field. Um, so I do have some material I'm happy to share it with you via email. My email is on the slides and I could also type it in the chat. Um, I think this is an area that is also new in, in regards um, to diversity equity research, but we do have information now. So I'd love to get that in your hands um, and I'm happy to, yeah. Brielle, do you have anything? I have a lot I could say, um, and I and I, I Camille, I know that you messaged me, and I I, I do want us to connect off um, out, away from the webinar, so I can give deeper thought to your question and provide you with some resources because I know they're out there. This, as mm -hmm. Jacqueline mentioned, this is a topic that does come up, um, and so I I can, would love to point you to some colleagues that I know are working in this specific area, but I'll just just give you my thoughts. So please do take me up mm -hmm. on that email offer. Um, and I, I want to address another question that's come up around um, follow-up and particularly our slide deck. Um, and I'm wondering if our CBC uh, co-facilitator can help answer, how might we go about sharing the slide deck? Um, I don't think it's in an in a appropriate format right now to share, but I want to um, ask you if there's a process for that or where students, or excuse me, where participants can um, expect to find maybe a link or a, a PDF to download in the future. Yeah, so uh, the recording of this as well as the slide deck will be available on our site. I'll drop the link in again. Um, mm -hmm. and the link that I drop in, let me make sure I'm dropping in the right link. I have so many of them. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is um, hold on. This is the link to our site. If you go under events, you'll see 2024 webinars. Um, there, we will mm -hmm. upload the recording of this webinar as well as the slide deck. Just give us a few days because we do have to caption the webinar before we post it. Uh, but that's where you'll be able to find this webinar, other uh, our past webinars, and our future webinars. Um, any other questions from anyone? Thank you. I don't see any in the chat. So, all right, ladies. Well, everyone, thank you so much for attending. As I said, I'm going to do one last plug for this survey because we really do ap appreciate your input, uh, your feedback on this uh, webinar. Um, all the chat, super positive um, uh, feedback. So I, I think it's safe to say that we all enjoyed the content. Thank you so very much. And again, I invite everyone to look at our future webinars on our site and register for them. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful Friday and um, a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much.